Thank you so very much for inviting me to this wonderful, energizing community. This morning, the folks I had breakfast with asked me, what is uh, my ultimate desire, if I could have anything? And of course, after fumbling around for a couple of minutes, we all said, peace on Earth. But what would we mean by peace on Earth if it were just peace among humans? How about the rest of nature? How about all that we depend on and hardly know? I've had a couple of incredible experiences in my life that enabled me to see into other species uh, at, at levels that uh, they hadn't been recognized before. Uh, with elephants, it happened 25 years ago when I went uncharacteristically to a zoo in Portland, Oregon. I had heard that there were several baby elephants born simultaneously, and I kind of wanted to see what it was like as these babies from different mothers from different continents uh, were integrated into what would eventually become a captive family. While I was in the zoo, I had a uh, sensation. I, I got permission to sit on a chair next to the elephant cage for a week. Um, I don't know really why I did that, but <laughs> I'd been studying whales for 15 years before that and their sounds. Well, somehow, the moment had come. While I was in that cage, or almost in that cage, I repeatedly felt a throbbing in the air. And uh, it obviously was not, it wasn't in any other part of the zoo. Uh, it wasn't associated with loud noises that I heard, but I thought perhaps it was, in fact, associated with sound. Um, and in, as time passed, I eventually got the notion that maybe this was sound made by elephants below the frequencies that human beings can hear. You know, we only are able to hear, we can't hear what bats say. How about below the frequencies that people could hear? Um, so I went back to Ithaca, New York, where I had just moved went to Cornell, found a couple of acoustic biologists, and said, how about it? Are any animals making sounds too low pitch for us to hear? And they said, you know, I don't think we've ever looked there. Take our equipment. Back to the zoo I went. And uh, this is the moment of discovery. I'm going to play you what it sounded like uh, one afternoon. <clears throat> When uh, <clears throat> the heating fan uh, was going off, uh, we were keeping notes, Bill Langbauer and I, um, on the behavior of the elephants. And we kept note uh, that the heating fan had gone off with Bill saying, one, two, three. Uh, and then we saw the old elephant who was acting like the matriarch of this herd uh, take off and start walking across a 90-foot long cage. As she walked, she flapped her ears against her neck. You'll hear that. And then she blew off into the air. This is what it sounded like, a very noisy zoo environment. Heating fan. Bill's voice. Flapping her ears as she walks. She blows out through her truck. Not very exciting, right? So I took the tape home <clears throat> and sped it up. And when you speed up a recording, uh, everything you have recorded comes up in pitch. So I speed it up 10 times, which means that everything went up two and a half octaves, bringing sound that I previously could not hear into my range of hearing. Here's the recording you'll hear. To keep me honest, you'll hear the heating fan <clears throat> at the beginning. Then when you hear Rosie's ears, they'll be fast because it was 10 times faster. Oh. Mm-hmm. 
discovery. <clears throat> there was a huge lot of communication going on that nobody had known about because it was just below what people can hear. And uh, at that time, we were feeling the throbbing in the air. And the third uh, person who was uh, together in this group, Elizabeth Thomas, ran outside to see what the old male bull elephant in the condition called musk, full of testosterone, very mean, uh, who'd been out throwing mud clods at the public, see where he was. Well, he had come up to the outside of the wall so that there was this thick concrete wall between a musk bull and an old female. And you heard the voices, uh, one high, one low, alternating. We suppose that those were the, vo the voices of those elephants. Well, uh, that good luck uh, that I'd had enabled me to go to Africa. And I spent the next 15 years in uh, uh, South and East Africa trying to figure out whether the low frequency calls of elephants were enabling them to coordinate their societies over long distances, because very low pitch sound travels very much better than high sounds. Eventually, we had all kinds of information. The answer is basically yes. And I was beginning to think about how in the world we could put this finding to work for the conservation of elephants. And it occurred to me, uh, in, in collaboration with uh, Andrea Tercalo, a researcher who's been working in Central African Republic, that it would be very good if we could take sounds of forest elephants as a way to learn about what's in the forest. So about a decade ago, I founded the Elephant Listening Project. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology, strangely enough, has a bioacoustics research program. And they, and they, they <clears throat> welcomed me in. Uh, <clears throat> well, here's the problem when you want to figure out what's going on underneath the forest. Um, how many elephants are in there? Uh, what are they doing? How about gorillas? How about the rest of it all? And how many forest elephants are there? Anyway, we see that the estimates, and these are IUCN estimates, the very best uh, for the time, were ranging from 16,000 and something to 82,000 and something. In other words, nothing was known about these animals. Now, there are, in the middle of the great Central African forest, which really spreads two-thirds of the way across the continent, <clears throat> There are occasional clearings made and maintained largely by elephants who come in there to drink from the salty uh, pits. They, they, they dig holes and, and, and uh, drink from them. And the one that has the most elephants, predictably and always, is called Zanga. Sometimes we would see as many as 100 elephants at one time, all ages and sexes, um, carrying out their lives. We were fortunate that uh, even though this is very far from the nearest road, uh, there was a tall observation platform that had been built for tourists. But it's hard to get to, and you have to wade through a lot of elephant dung. And there are um, crocodiles and things like that. So not many tourists were coming. And we were allowed to use this as a place for our research. Here you see Andrea Turcalo, the real heroine of the story of, uh, of forest elephants. And by the way, there's going to be a 60-minute show on this project, um, perhaps this, this Sunday, if not the following Sunday, and followed up by one in January. And I think the January one is going to focus on Andrea. She knows 3,000 elephants by eye. She uh, built herself a beautiful camp a couple of kilometers from this by, or clearing, uh, to which she walks every day, keeping track of who's there and what's going on. So she and uh, I became partners in this research to find out about the acoustic side of the behavior of the elephant she knew so well. I should say right away, there are lots of calls you can hear. Lots of elephant calls that are partly infrasonic and partly audible. But I got my access to uh, 
this wonderful field work by making that infrasound discovery. What's going on here is that uh, some of the Biaca pygmies and uh, Chris Clark are hauling uh, some apparatus up into a tree. Inside the yellow boxes are tiny boxes uh, that uh, are that will rec digital recorders that then store as much as three months of continuous data. So once you put these gizmos up into a tree, uh, you don't have to do anything about them. The arrow is pointing to one of them, and you see the elephants are undisturbed. They're going about their lives undisturbed normally. And that is one of the great things about this technology. Most animal behavior studies disturb the animals that are being watched. Well, we wanted to watch them to see what was going on, who was making what kind of vocalization, uh, whether, in fact, if we had long, long recordings in a forest where there was nobody present, we could identify the voices of adult females, of um, infants, of males, and could identify also some of the crucial behaviors, such as reproduction, without which, of course, we would say something's going wrong with that population. Uh, so we saw all of this. We were up on top of the uh, platform uh, for months and months, uh, now looking down from the sky from an airplane. You see those red uh, signals, which tell you where we put uh, an array of microphones of these autonomous recording units surrounding the clearing. The reason we did that is that we wanted to triangulate on the calling elephant. And we could do it because the, uh, the way sound travels, it always takes the same amount of time to go a given distance. So a sound that is closer to unit four than to unit five will, you, you see, you can triangulate and figure out just who is calling. And uh, this process was good to within three meters, which is one elephant length. So we came home with lots and lots of video recordings and lots and lots of acoustic recordings. And we were able to link the behavior to the individuals. And this is the sort of thing that it was like. Here we see uh, a large bull. Can you see my arrow there? This is Gray Boy. He is not in must, but he is an adult bull. This is Eli. He is in must, which means he is automatically dominant to all other elephants, except another must bull bigger than him. Uh, this is a sneaky little female who's going to get into the pit and have a sip. And uh, Eli tolerates her, but he doesn't tolerate Gray Boy. Now let's have some sound here, a little video. A uh, Gray Boy is about to make a mistake. He would like the pit. But Eli has chased him away. Whoops. I want this to continue. And Eli backs into his pit and makes a must rumble, which is too low pitched for us to hear at all in our recorder. But those calls that we hear are from the females over to this side and some others that are off screen. And I knew from the work I had done in, the, in East Africa that those are greeting rumbles to a must male by females. So now we have three kinds of call. You see, we're beginning to write the dictionary. If you look at this, what you're seeing is spectrogram. That is to say, a running chart on which that has music writing on it. And you see there's six layers, those layers each one comes from the recording that was made by one of the autonomous recording units surrounding the clearing. Now let's listen to the whole sequence. Here comes Gray Boy shouting, I surrender. Here comes Eli saying, I am Eli. Here come the females saying, we recognize a male in must.
And the map down on the right-hand corner shows the, ident the locations of those individuals and how we knew that it was really them. So now we begin to get the words for our dictionary. See if you can tell me what this one is. I surrender, right? And uh, for each unit that we had a lot of information on, uh, we also uh, were able to say, when we get more situations, we'll uh, correct and amplify what we know about it. Um, I'm going to let finish by letting you see just what it was like uh, to watch these individuals uh, as we got to know families. I hope I can let you see that. Oh dear. Well, I'm sorry I can't. Um, they are, as you know, uh, extremely compassionate with one another. Uh, families take care of each other's babies. Uh, even families that have never seen an individual in the clearing before uh, will help it if it loses its mother. Um, and uh, will mourn if they find a, a dead in individual. On one occasion, I watched, we watched and filmed 127 elephants walking along a well-worn trail uh, past a, a, the corpse of a little baby that had died. Uh, one adolescent male uh, tried to lift her up 57 times. Um, there were groans. Uh, uh, heartbreaking, um, and, uh, and that particular fellow went back and visited her five times. And that's just one, uh, you know, one teeny example. I would have liked to show you something else. But we live in a world that is far more than human, and the problems of this world are greater than human, although the problems in conservation are largely caused by negligence and by the fact that we have this great separation between our concerns for humans and our concerns for other animals, even animals that we care about very deeply. Thank you. <laughs>